So on the same day that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene in the garden, his friends, his disciples, are all hiding from the authorities together. John does not tell us in the text uh, where Thomas is when the other disciples are hiding together in the upper room. Uh, Maybe Thomas ran out for supplies. Maybe he got separated from the group somehow on their way across town. Uh, Maybe the other disciples forgot to tell Thomas, like, hey, we're headed back to the house now. Uh, Whatever happens, when Jesus shows up, Thomas isn't there. Jesus does show up. He comes right on in through the locked door. He gives the disciples a greeting of peace, and he immediately shows his friends his hands and his side. We can remember that back in the garden, Mary mistook Jesus for the gardener, uh, so maybe Jesus is trying to save some time here by just letting them know right away that it's really him. Uh, Whatever his reasoning It works. John says the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. The disciples have an encounter with the Lord. Jesus shows up when they least expect him, three days after his execution, and shows them that it's really him, that he really has risen from the dead. And after the disciples have seen Jesus, seen his wounds, and believe that it's him, Jesus sends them out in the name of God the Creator and with the loving power of the Holy Spirit. I guess Jesus had a full calendar of post-resurrection commitments because by the time Thomas catches back up with the rest of the disciples, Jesus is gone. The disciples filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas's response is understandable, right? I mean, his friends are all hanging out without him. And the next time he sees them, they're going, Thomas, Thomas, we just saw Jesus. Yeah, Jesus of Nazareth. He's resurrected. He's not dead anymore. If I were Thomas, I would also be skeptical. Uh, surely his friends are confused. They, they don't know what they're seeing, but it can't be what they think they saw. He gets kind of a raw deal, right, to be known as Doubting Thomas. He's actually just asking for the same experience everybody else has. The disciples... The ten that were gathered have just seen Jesus, and Thomas says, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. Fair enough. When we talk about this passage every year, the Sunday after Easter, we often tend to imagine ourselves as Thomas. In a time like ours, when we are very aware of conspiracy theories and misinformation all around us, uh, we, like Thomas, generally like a little more to go on than just someone's word, especially when what they're saying is something as unimaginable as resurrection. And it's kind of reassuring too, right? When we have experienced doubts or uncertainties in our own faith, to think that even someone so close to Jesus, one of his 12 disciples, experienced that same sort of doubt. So imagining ourselves as Thomas is pretty familiar, can feel kind of affirming, but I want to challenge you today to take a minute And imagine yourself instead as one of the other disciples. As one of the folks that was in the room when Jesus first walked through the door and showed his wounds and breathed out the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So three days after seeing Jesus crucified, you've just encountered the risen Lord. It was terrifying at first. Jesus walked right in through the locked door. But when you saw his hands and his side, you rejoiced because you knew that everything had changed. Your buddy Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to you, but you were so excited to tell him what happened. When you saw him, you and the rest of the gang hurried straight up to him and got right to the point. We have seen the Lord. And you waited for Thomas to rejoice, just like you did, in the knowledge that Jesus had risen from the dead. But Thomas didn't rejoice. In fact, Thomas lets you know in no uncertain terms that he doesn't even believe you. What a letdown, right? What a disappointment. It's your first try at evangelism, and your own friend Thomas, your own pal, doesn't even believe that Jesus is risen. Talking about evangelism, for a lot of us, can be a little scary. It can kind of seem like a tough word. We might worry about being pushy or closed-minded. Maybe we worry about not knowing what to do or what to say. But I think that if we can see ourselves as the other disciples here, the ten that first see Jesus, There might be some good news about evangelism here in the story of Thomas. We can imagine ourselves as these other disciples because we have experienced the resurrection of Christ. If you're like me, you probably have not physically seen the wound in Jesus' side or in his hands. Um, You may not have experienced Jesus walking through the locked door to where you're hiding from the authorities, but we have experienced the resurrection. We have felt hope when hope was totally lost. We've seen transformation that we never thought was possible. We've experienced boundary-breaking communities that overcome divisions of age and race and gender and ability, and we have rejoiced because we have seen the Lord. And maybe we're also familiar with the disappointment the disciples must have felt waiting for Thomas to rejoice with them, only to find out he doesn't believe the disappointment of knowing that Christ is risen and everything has changed, but seeing a world that is still letting death have the final say. But I think there's some good news about evangelism in the story of Thomas. I have to confess first that the disciples are admittedly not always the best model for how to follow Jesus. Uh, It was not too long ago during Holy Week, they were up to some shenanigans, betraying and denying Jesus. But I think in this case, they might get it right. In verse 25, after the disciples tell Thomas that they've seen Jesus, Thomas says, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. John doesn't tell us what the disciples say after that, but it's worth noticing, I think, what the disciples don't say. They don't argue with Thomas. They don't have, like, a comeback ready. Uh, They don't try guilt or fear-mongering to win Thomas over to their side. They don't break out the scriptures to demonstrate with facts and logic and reasoning that prophecy is being fulfilled. Because Thomas tells the disciples that he will not believe until he sees Jesus' wounds. The disciples didn't believe that Jesus was risen because they reasoned it out for themselves, or because Mary Magdalene showed up and made a convincing argument. 
They believed because they experienced Jesus. Reasoning with Thomas, they seemed to realize, isn't going to get him to believe in the resurrection. An experience of Jesus will. So they don't argue with Thomas. What do they do? Based on what John tells us, it seems that the disciples just keep hanging out with their buddy Thomas. They live their lives, lives that have certainly been changed by the resurrection of Christ. They stay in community with Thomas, even though Thomas has not experienced the risen Lord and does not yet believe. And we know that Thomas is there in the midst of their lives because the next time Jesus shows up, there's Thomas. In verse 26, a week has passed, and finally Thomas gets the experience he's been holding out for. The experience all the other disciples have already had, the thing that led them to believe, an encounter with resurrection. Jesus shows up for Thomas, and he shows him his wounds in his hands and his side, and Thomas believes. Thomas says, my Lord and my God, because Thomas has seen Jesus and experienced the power of the resurrection of Christ. Even though it can be kind of hard for us to wrap our heads around sometimes, we are a people that is called to evangelize. Jesus tells us to go make disciples. The mission statement of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples for the transformation, make disciples of Jesus Christ, excuse me, for the transformation of the world. And in the midst of hatred and war and poverty and injustice, it becomes clear that the world around us is in need of an encounter with the resurrected Lord. The world is in need of an experience of love and peace and flourishing and justice. So how do we do that? How are we as the church supposed to witness to the power of the resurrection in a world that pretty understandably needs to see to believe? How are we supposed to say, we have seen the Lord without sounding hollow or foolish? Following in the footsteps of the disciples in the upper room, we do it through loving community and by making room for Jesus to show up. When the disciples see Thomas, the first thing they do is say, we have seen the Lord. They declared that Christ was risen. I think we've done that one. I think we can check it off. We have built churches. We put bumper stickers on our cars and wear t-shirts that tell everyone that we're a Christian. I think in the United States, we have accomplished saying we have seen the Lord. But the challenge now, the same challenge the disciples had when Thomas did not believe, was that that's not enough. We've communicated our belief in God, but we can't convince anyone that Christ is risen and death is defeated unless they encounter Jesus. For the disciples, letting Thomas encounter Jesus was pretty simple. They just had to wait around for Jesus to show back up. We could try that. I think we'd be waiting a while. So in 2024, we have some new challenges. It's a little less likely that Jesus will come on in through the locked doors and show us his wounds. But there's still good news. The good news is that like the disciples, we have been sent out by Christ and given the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus might not come physically through the door, but his love and the transformative power of his resurrection can show up through the, for, for the world through us, through the church, through the body of Christ. 
the good news is that we don't have to make all of the best complex arguments or host the most interesting events or develop the best marketing strategy for Jesus. We just need to be in loving community with each other and with the folks around us and to make space for Jesus to show up in by living our lives, our individual lives and our collective lives as a community in a way that testifies to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus so that the world can encounter him through us. When the church, the body of Christ, is transformed and lives like Jesus is alive, that's how we evangelize. That's how we witness to the power of God. That's how the world can experience the power of resurrection and say of the God of love and peace and justice, my Lord and my God. Amen.